updating the website soon because there's an added speaker at the, at the end of the series as well. But everything else on, on, the, ser on the syllabus will stay the same. There might be a slot or two to fill in, but nothing changed. So. And so today we're really happy to have Caitlin Fisher here, who's our um, uh, guest from uh, in the digital realm. And, uh, but she's been doing well the whole time, really. Uh, her uh, just fascinating work in digital narrative and branches of that um, in various directions, like all uh, branches of both. So, um, she, uh, Caitlin Fisher holds a Canada Research Chair in Digital Culture in the Department of Film at York University, Toronto, which is not really in Toronto, but like on the side of Toronto. Uh, but it's a nice campus. A co founder of York's Future Cinemas Lab, Cinema Lab. Her research investigates the future of narrative through explorations of interactive storytelling and interactive cinema in augmented, augmented reality environments, um, which is itself a story in itself, but hopefully she'll tell us about some of these things. She completed York's first hypertextual dissertation in 2000 and her hypermedia novella, These Waves of Girls, won the Electronic Literature Organization's 2001 Award for Fiction. Her augmented reality poem, Andromeda, was awarded the 2008 International Linaros Prize for Electronic Literature. She will show some examples of how creating AR poetry has changed as expressive tools and technologies have themselves changed over the past decade, from marker-based to natural feature detection, most notably, and talk about her current work with Meta Space Glass, a better than Google Glass-like technology still in beta that promises a collaborative, networked, and persistent AR experience that may change both mobile media and AR. Um, the research project is entitled Augmented, Augmented Reality Glass, Surveillance, Wearable Computing, and New Literary Forms. So please join me in welcoming um, Caitlin Fisher. It's a great pleasure to be here and to share a story of some of my work with you. Um, I am um, going to structure this talk as a part um, sort of history of some of the experiments we've had going on in the lab, share some of my work and the work of some of my students, and uh, also uh, talk a little bit about the future. Um, so a bit, of a bit of a history and a bit of a show and tell. And I understand there's quite a bit of time for questions at the end, so I hope that um, I'll have the opportunity to see where your interests align with mine. So I direct an art science lab, and I guess we now call it a STEAM or Tinkery lab, and specifically my lab uh, for the past decade has been focused on augmented reality storytelling. And so I hope that some of the future fictions whose contours I see, if imperfectly, and some of the works I'd like to show uh, will resonate with some of your own ideas and practices and possible futures. So. I was thinking that some of you here might not be at all familiar with augmented reality. Um, we like to think of it as a new immersion genre. Um, in our lab, we work iteratively and across disciplinary boundaries, as I understand you do here, uh, particularly between computer science, creative writing, and the fine and performing arts. If you're not familiar, actually, how many people here do not know what augmented reality is? Okay, so there's still a few people. Um, it essentially is a technology that, um, that merges real and virtual image streams. So you see the real world and you see digital images overlaid on it. You know, sort of like, you know, magic bubbles come off of your book. Um, you could have ghosts sitting in the corner. You could have um, vir practicing virtual medicine. I could be looking at somebody and, and seeing their internal organs. So you actually see the physical world and you have a digital overlay that we typically say is re registered um, in real time. Um, historically, this is an industrial application, but for the past 10 years in our lab, actually probably the past 11 years now, we've offered writers, artists, and theorists the opportunity to work with these new tools and to see how we could harness augmented reality um, for, uh, for art and storytelling. 
Um, I thought I'd put up this uh, slide and, sh and start by showing an example of really early work in the lab, 2008, uh, in case there were people who'd never seen augmented reality. This is a very early kind of augmented reality. It was created by a graduate student uh, then in the lab, Jeffrey Allen Rhodes, who I understand later came to work here at uh, the University of Buffalo. He's now at the Art Institute of Chicago. But this is a really fun early student project. It has a runtime of just a couple of minutes. I'm going to show it. Um, this is um, uh, computer vision-based augmented reality, or as we say, sort of AR on the cheap. There are ways of doing, you know, million-dollar augmented reality. There are ways of doing very affordable paper-based augmented reality. In the early days of our lab, we did a lot of marker-based AR, and this uh, video documentation of a work he calls 52 Card Psycho um, kind of can demonstrate the principle. So it's split screen, and you'll see what the naked eye sees on the left, and you'll be able to see the augmented version. I want you to see Psycho way I originally made it, the version TV did not dare show. <laughs> I always love that piece because it gives a sense of one kind of augmented reality and how it might be useful. We can take time-based media and spatialize it. You can have the magic of having something that ordinarily would not have um, movement, and now you have it. 
So back to my story. So one of the things that I think a lot about are the ways in which new technologies might allow us to tell stories differently and how emerging literacies and expressive tools might affect the kind of stories we want to engage in and for how long and where. 20 years ago, I worked in the area of hypermedia and my early research was deeply invested in linking structures and the epistemological challenge link node constellations might pose to academic writing and the possibilities they might open up. I loved the idea of a text with multiple points of entry and many pathways breaking the philosophical line and knowledge domain visualizations giving us new ways to communicate argument as well as structure, both the politics and the poetry of sculpting with data. From there it wasn't far to imagining the possibilities of using digital tools to create new kinds of narratives outside of my more scholarly work. I began to experiment with hypertext fictions and poetry, trying to understand new grammars and possibilities working at the interface to explore the relationship between tools and content. My creative and academic work veered then towards digital poetics and at that time web-based work, since that's where most of the work was taking place. This is just a quick um, screen capture of a um, very, very early piece about 15 years ago, um, um, an early hypermedia novella, I'm just showing some of the basic hypertext interactions. At the same time, down at Georgia Tech, Computer vision scientists were working alongside theorists and writers and designers to create easy to use software with augmented reality, at that time an emerging technology. I fell in love with the idea of AR as an emerging artistic genre and organized a research program around this, guided by the premise that we live in a culture with the unprecedented capacity to bring together the physical and the virtual, to transform our relationship to objects and landscapes through the addition of computer generated information to create interactive art and spatialized story worlds, and that it was important to make and think alongside these objects to better understand what constitutes a successful, compelling, and emotionally rich experience in these kinds of environments. And then I got a room. I applied for funding for this room, and for a long while the room was empty. Later it was filled with tracking devices. The room was a pretty terrifying puzzle. It was, I was supposed to make stories in it, stories people might want to engage in while inside it. And I felt little in my formal or informal training had equipped me for creating room-shaped narratives. I kicked myself that I hadn't studied theater or circus arts or sound walks or even installation art. I had to think about point of view and what came after point of view editing and plot, what plot, how, and closure and ways to travel a story or move a reader through it all over again. It was a terrifying prospect and also a thrilling one. So my talk today is essentially about some discoveries I made resisting and writing poems and stories in and for that room and beyond it, and some predictions I'm going to make for future fictions based on my understanding of reading and writing and crafting narratives at the intersection of emerging technologies and interfaces. I tend to avoid being a futurist, but I'm actually going to give it a shot here. I definitely see that there are multiple paths, a proliferation of possible futures, and that my vision is necessarily partial. Nevertheless, here I go. I'm also going to give you a bit of a show and tell along the way, focusing on works my students and I have created in the lab, especially for those of you who don't have ready touchstones for these kinds of pieces. There's my room. But let me begin my argument for the future by stepping get back again for a selective, very skeletal history. Unlike my experience with The Room, when I first faced the computer screen as a graduate student and explored hypermedia, I felt like I had mad translatable skills. I seemed to have everything that I could have on the printed page and more. Hypermedia practice resonated strongly with many early and experimental forms and dreams with which I was familiar, and I read hypermedia against story quilting and fromage and shoebox archives, as well as more mainstreamed practices. At the time I started working with hypermedia, story space was taking off. You probably never heard of it, but it was basically a technology formed by people working deeply at the intersection of computer science and literature. Basically dream software created by English PhDs who thought about stories and poetry and words the way and the way they were crafted in a way that appealed to my own sensibilities. Story space, as the name suggests, organized text and, less elegantly, some rich media spatially. It had sophisticated guard fields, sticky pathways, collaborative potential, and identical reading and writing environments. 
What came next, namely Mosaic and HTML, probably set back electronic literature by 20 years. We're only now at the point where we're thinking again about the kind of sophisticated tech-enabled narratives that were probably available to us in the mid-1990s. One of the things that happened too in that initial movement from page to screen, whether the, spatial, whether the spatial narrative of story space or the large linking potential of HTML, was that stories got bigger, potentially vast, right? They certainly didn't always get better, maybe they never got better. But in general, the digital canvas was understood as being fairly limitless and that this feature was worth exploring. There were fewer thoughts about diminishing returns, and I say this kindly as someone who once crafted a piece with 17,000 links. Theorists of electronic literatures at that time talked about different ways, whoops, hang on, talked about different ways of following links and how we might leave breadcrumbs for others, what it might mean to engage a text with no last page or final frame, how to create narrative tension, how appreciating the structure of the work might signal the end of reading it, and of course, the pleasure of rereading, a practice certainly not unique to hypertext, but an easy act for the linking author to encourage or mandate, urging pathways to collide at clusters of nodes, willing the reader to see the passage so very differently and perhaps be changed the next time around. And I suppose enough time has passed now that I can let you in on an inside joke from a conference hallway many years ago. Twenty of us in that hallway. A quick straw poll revealing that we had collectively written about 25 hypertext works that year and had collectively read two, begging the question of the pleasures of writing hypertext narratives as opposed to reading them and what it means to engage with expressive authoring tools. But kind of bracket that for a second. And I'm just going to show you another student work here. Um, to get a sense, this is a different kind of augmented reality. This is spatialized, and this is, again, playing with the idea of the vast possibilities. This is Mike Skolnick's work, and he did this in his MA. What can we do with digital technology and new media aesthetics to make a poem navigable and interactive? Raymond Canoe wrote 100,000 billion 14-line sonnets algorithmically using only 140 lines of text. Ten candidates for each of the sonnet's 14 lines were stacked on different pages, with horizontal cuts so you could turn individual lines as well as the pages. This allowed 100,000 billion possibilities. Inspired by Kano, I created an augmented reality installation piece by breaking Christian Book's poem Vowels into 13 sound clips that would be triggered when a tracker entered a particular zone in the installation space. The interactor moving through the installation can trigger these in any order, exploding Book's poem into 6,227,020,800 poetic possibilities. Loveless vessels, we bow so love. We see love so lost. Else we see love so bold. Selves we woo. We lose. Losses we many. We owe. This only scratches the surface of what can be done in this sort of installation. More sound clips make for exponentially more possible readings, and factoring in interactor choices like only triggering some of the sounds would make the number of possibilities nearly infinite. What would be most impressive to my mind would be multi-sequential poems. We sell those bounds, so we love less well, so low. So level, wolves evolve. A poem that could have its lines arranged in any order while still making sense, with each different sequence of lines changing the meaning of the whole poem, would make the most of the interactivity that this sort of installation allows for. It's a tall, but not impossible, order for the future. So that's one direction sort of the vast um, stories go in. But let's look at what else happened after story space. So 
So textual writing gives way to full-fledged hypermedia. So again, we're moving from the hypertext to what happens immediately following. And one of the things that encourages this is better bandwidth, of course. Moving images are now possible. Not full out video at this point, but certainly vector animation. So at this time, I'm teaching flash to students, and the machines work on our thoughts as the stories move from the spatialized canvas to the timeline following the demands of the software. A very different kind of story is created when you must set it on a line. Flash was also fairly tedious to craft, so it favored the one or two minute story, at least for beginners. These are the vines of electronic literature, where the never-ending books, the books without end as Robert Cougar identified them at the turn of the last century, become almost by necessity so much shorter, favoring the poem or the puzzle game, not the long form, favoring the cinematic. I try to introduce story space to the Flash students and everyone wants to hit play and make something happen. The elegance of the dual reading-writing environment is understood as a liability. All that coding for no moving image payoff and voiceover replaces written text at this time. Forward a few more years, spatialized storytelling reemerges in the form of stories located in the physical world in which the interface of the story is you moving through the world holding your GPS-enabled device. These are locative media stories, the mobile media narratives of the early and mid-2000s. For those of us in places like Buffalo, our hands are freezing, night falls fast. We're hoping as supervisors of these projects that there are only 10 nodes and my face falls when I realize I've agreed to be the external examiner for a mobile media narrative with 30 nodes across two football fields. Damn. And the technology's not quite there. You keep running back and forth across these hotspots in search of the narrative line, any narrative line, also sometimes any media at all. And the distances are so great, the hotspots so necessarily large, we're not back into the beautiful looping structures of reading and rereading we found on desktop screens, being a different person having passed these nodes before. And later, for the early augmented reality mobile works, even daylight is the enemy. Even now, this is one of the big problems, shadows, daylight, changing light conditions. So it's very, very difficult to have a compelling and really satisfying mobile work. There are a number of excellent experiments at this time, though, the early to mid-2000s. Mobile Bristol comes to mind, and a gorgeous vision for ubiquitous poetry out of Barcelona that promised to return guard fields so that you might walk the Ramblas, knowing that different poems would be served up at different times based on where you'd walked before. But I never heard of a fully realized work, and tellingly, I can't even remember the name of the software now. Grant money begins to flow to research projects that combine mobile media and augmented reality. Not so much to fine art or literature, though we siphon some off, but mostly the digital humanities and STEM disciplines. And a lot of the digital humanities work involves historical sites and is less about new stories for new screens than mimetic recreation in the tradition of 3D modeling from blueprints for, augmented, for virtual reality. My own work in augmented reality emerges from the perspective that it's just way too much labor to create a 3D chair perfectly registered in the real world when I can just move an analog chair to that same spot. AR is already the far more theoretically interesting but uglier relation to virtual reality in terms of production values. And I'm less about fooling the senses than trying to make the world more surprising. I think a lot about what it means to have haunted objects telling stories and love how the analog and the digital work together in the AR storytelling machine. Augmented reality is poised to become a $20 billion industry not because it makes us catch our breath in the same way that virtual rea some virtual reality environments do, but rather because of the way in which the real world still matters in these works. To serving up context-specific advertising, absolutely, but also because critically for us, the physical world is co-constitutive of the meaning of a work. It makes part of the story happen. And we can use this as artists. This is incredible. So I think a lot about what it means to have AR narratives set in libraries or in historically important neighborhoods that rely on a reader's understanding of librariness or place or politics. The location can carry so much of the weight of this narrative, making AR fiction more like film or immersive theater than the book. And this is part of the new toolkit for artists. These um, screenshots are from an augmented reality installation we did last year um, at a Pioneer Village as part of a show called Landslide in Toronto. 
But for the most part, when we think about the ideal granularity and scale of these kinds of electronic fictions, and keeping aside Michael Skolnick's work, where he actually is trying to investigate how they could go big again, at this time we're still thinking pretty small. Most of the things are starting to contract because of the tools we're using. And remember, because they're, they're, they're difficult to, to make long and nobody wants to inhabit these for very long. So right now, at this time, the ideal granularity and scale of these kinds of electronic fictions, it seemed reasonable to turn our backs on vast narratives. I'm thinking really, at, especially around 2005, 2006, we really start to see this happen. Um, the setup favors the whispered secret the one paragraph text. No one wants to stand still in a spot for 10 minutes. We can't even stand 100 delicious secrets because we can't hold the iPad up in front of us for very long, even if we really love the poem. And think about it. Would you really want to walk with your iPad in front of you for an hour? So the majority of these experiments are short for all sorts of good reasons, and we spend little time in them. This is a little early AR piece that was just made sort of in a treasure test. And you just pull up little, little poems. So as my tools were in their intermediary form, I still resisted writing for that room, and I resisted mobile media. I made very small worlds. Haunted cabinets, first-person confessionals, treasure boxes, book objects. So I'm going to show you a few examples here from that early stage, and a quick evolution of projects from uh, marker-based augmented reality to natural feature detection. So here's some very rough documentation from an early piece from 2008. And this is a prototype for a, of Andromeda, an augmented reality poem about stars, loss, and women named Isabel, for which I overlaid a dollar store pop-up book with a small poem series. Remember the poor man who had jumped up, jumped up by the side of the slides cave? So, I saw the pictures of just one of the stone delicate, the delicate, the jury of the chance. Even then, it was meant for the year, but she swashed the leaves out of the grass, 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 the grass,
I've been with my grandmother forever, since my parents went on holiday to Morocco in 1967 and didn't come back. No one bought me sleepers, just waited for my little feet to pop through the bottoms of the thin material in 1968. Finally, it just wouldn't be waiting in good faith to buy sleepers. They won't come back. They might come back. They won't come back. I've been with my grandmother since my best summer I could get her At seven, she takes me for a portrait, parents only. I'm sitting in a big chair in front of the camera. I can barely hear her hiss to the woman at the front desk. Can't orphans have their pictures taken? Oh, your mother and father would kill me if they heard that, she tells me later. I hold her hand. We laugh because clearly I am not an orphan. I hear stories about my mother who was walking along the street one day and saw that a ship was leaving the next week and knew she should be on it, so she was. It's the 60s after all. She's a paper maker, a linguist, a painter, a flamenco dancer, and a very smart girl alone on a boat and on her way to Europe. I remember going somewhere and waving at that ship. Is that my mother going? Tap, tap, tap. Morse code on my grandmother's shoulder. Take me home. I hear stories about school. My friends and I try very hard to let our mothers know how much we love them. Our mothers are small, after all, and easily hurt. We have mothers who cry, sleep all day, weep curtains from beads we later choke on. We have the kind of mothers who do not know how to but who will shake us upside down to get beads or pennies out. And when they laugh, they spin us around and around till we're almost sick. Our mothers know makes ginseng and Carnaby Street. We have mothers who make their own poisonous pigments and keep vats of mulch on the patio. Mothers we need to tuck in at night after parties. Mothers we tell to please get more milk and who is sleeping in my bed at seven and didn't come. Mother who is walking around the street on the stage. It's not a question of pleasure that it's a years later. A friend made her palm of sweet that familiar sleep. Bring grannies to school. Tell me I promised. And she bakes the emergency grannies for me from scratch at 7.30 in the morning and gets me on the school bus at 8. Cakes, fudge, squares, lemon bars. Now there's no flour in the house. She's a paper workman. Summers the doorbell would ring and it would be Mrs. Smith at Harold. Go get a seat for Harold, my grandmother would say. Sure. I struggled with the chair. It was big and I was still small. Mrs. Smith did a small shuffle to the chairs. Where's Harold? I'd ask Joey. Oh, Harold's dead, love. Just pretend. My grandmother did this race with her flamenco ancestors. You, you get the idea of that. And, and actually, what's funny for that piece was that because I did kind of like the effect, I didn't like it so much for Andromeda originally, but I love the idea of pulling back. This is the same technology that Alan Rhodes had used for the 52-card Psycho. So, the, so we had uh, the, the software was able to track sort of 52 of these easily at a time. So making use of that, that you could have um, the, the small story, but also the cacophony as the camera moves back and gets all of these stories that come at you at once in time. That was a feature I wanted to play with a lot. This is uh, the later version where everything is inside this treasure trunk and there's a girl that walks through it and every one of these individual objects, instead of seeing the black and white markers, now you can pick up a, pick up a tray or pick up a piece of paper and all of these things trigger the same kinds of stories. Um, changing the experience, though. We did a lot of early work um, based on the idea that we wanted to have pieces that could leave the lab easily and that could maybe still be shown on the web. And one of the first ways that we could do this uh, was using FLAR Toolkit, a uh, flash-based augmented reality solution. And we built a lot of architectures that um, if you actually look, the, the piece on the left and the piece on the right, um, the underlying code is actually identical, and we've just swapped out different images. So we worked very hard to create these, um, these information architectures that could tell multiple stories, and we gave them to people so that they could use this code to create their own works for basically no money at all, and then distribute them on the web, and people could just print out a marker and hold them up. And um, so we did that for a long time. And I'm going to show you a piece called Requiem. And this was actually a small poem that, um, uh, that originally my father did. And so it's, it's voiceover. It had originally been spatialized, where it's a whole series where every stanza would be sort of created in space. When it went to the web, it was sort of relentlessly linear. I'm not going to show you the whole piece, but I'll give you a little bit of a flavor for it and um, um, for these early works. The less fashionable camped in the park bought souvenirs such as teacups, commemorative portraits twisted in nails and wool. This was a requiem Others for a poet who died indigent. Arrived in borrowed coaches, wearing ill-fitting wigs, court breeches, hand-me-downs from family albums, all unknown to us. Now black as bells, the doors of the Abbey are closed. Obviously it's a bit tongue-in-cheek. 
Pray take your seats. This is the funeral of Jeremy Lynch the third. Prepare to shed a fire tear. Her Majesty the Queen floats in procession. Divers Anglican bishops abnormally vested mutter the Latin rite. Epile hili quindum quam pascem cognomit nos gestiam requiem. The voice of the dead, that Welsh mellifluous voice, rises like incense. To his microphone, the immortals flock like birds from their niches. Greet a true Ontario bar, the haiku master, our Tom, had you but lived, etc. And now, that voice again, we are taking you over to... I'm going to move through it, but all of these represent different... Um, different stanzas and were originally um, sort of different moments in space. I'll play a couple Not of them. And daft enough to be believed or better still ignored. I for my part detest such gossip. His clothes were rich me doubt. Why shame can bell a fair. Likewise his sleeping hours, his endless feuds with lodging keepers, poppycock, who cares? I welcome such eccentrics and approve the thing of proffered to normality, the norm being what it is. A lunatic would be straight jacketed for dreaming it. Besides, the man was poor. Had he been rich? But that's another tale. The man was poor, careless with money, sick, improvident. Small wonder that in friends or fantasy he sought such comfort as he could. No blame. Driven to ships, the outlaw like the one whose custom is to move a wind-up toy between two paychecks does the thing he must. The wonder is he asked so little, stayed within the bounds of courtesy. just play the end of it. The one thing I will say about this piece though is that on the web where it just becomes stanza after stanza it always begs the question of oh it would just be nicer to read it or oh it would just be nicer to just have the poem and the audio. What we'd imagine though in the same workflow is we also created these for the immersive spaces and it's a very very different thing to walk through these like they're rooms that you're inhabiting and so learning from what didn't work here actually helped us to realize what the value would be for augmented reality in another situation. I'll just finish the last stanza here since it was an homage to this poet. Epitaph. When all is said and done, dear Thomas, as now it is, and you are turned to stone, where box of tricks and bag of tricks are one with truth and fancy fell from any song. Forgive us who for want of charity affronted you with cold asperity and smile at this, your epitaph. He strung a lute that much adversity had worn yet found great joy in it. A gentle man, he sought the sweetness of an age removed and all the lively arts, but friendship most he loved. Okay. We also made a lot of AR theaters and documentaries in collaboration with people from other departments, particularly with historians. Um, this is from um, never before told stories of the Underground rail Railroad um, for school children. And this is an app that you can just download in the App Store. And again, um, these you know, can sit on a table and uh, photographs suggest these scenes, uh, but also a very compelling um, use of these kinds of uh, AR is to make them large scale and to have to inhabit these stories. It was actually quite a beautiful project. Um, this is some of the um, software we created where it's just drag and drop. You'll notice that a lot of these, that almost all of the um, things we've shown to date have been 2D. Um, this is actually not the way augmented reality is typically done. Generally they're all 3D objects, but at the time I was working with a lot of filmmakers and uh, everybody had lots of film and people didn't have a lot of 3D models. So we worked very hard just to say, within an hour you'll be able to use this archive. This is my daughter who always did a lot of augmented reality um, um, work. All of her school dioramas were in AR and very, very easy to code. 
So that, those were the, the early time. So I collaborated uh, with vision scientists to build that drag and drop expressive software tools um, so, that, um, so that everybody, one of the big philosophies of our lab was that augmented reality had to be put into the hands of people who knew stories, uh, poets and screenwriters and filmmakers and artists of all kinds in order to get a critical mass to establish new conventions for what was then still a wide open forum, still is. And sure, we sent our recreation of the Labyrinth Pavilion from Expo 67, that's what you're seeing there, into the immersive tracking system, the room. But our most popular variant of the project was still a tabletop version accessed via iPad rather than the heavy tethered optical see-through display. And my lab really tended toward the miniature even as recently as two or three years ago. Even when we could do you know, the million dollar setup, people still wanted to do the small handheld. Here I think I'm just going to show one of my most bookish, wor bookish works. It's called 200 Castles, and the piece is an interactive AR spatialized series of small stories set in both the domestic spaces of a castle and in the spaces of memory. And the viewer unlocks a story using the iPad as a magic looking glass, looking at a series, a book of old illustrations, and basically it's just a PDF with the required images. When the iPad's camera sees the photo, the augmented reality technology overlays a series of small digital scenes, suggesting the coexistence of multiple decades and triggering subtly interlocking stories of longing, archiving, sex, regret, wounds. So basically, um, you know, the same technology you've been seeing. There's also a small mystery embedded in the old newspaper footage that I use that nobody actually engages. This was actually, I'll just go back here a sec, this was a deliberately bookish project because of the exhibition context. It was uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And I just knew that if I had um, you know, an early iteration of the project that was like a 3D model that you touched, I knew nobody would uh, be able to understand how it would work in the library context. So even though that was a far more interesting interface, sort of a miniature chateau that allowed the reader to explore different rooms and gardens, and you had to use the iPad to touch different points, um, I just felt it wasn't going to work um, for, for that particular context. And again, that was a story that could be um, explored in any order. And the version that I ended up with was a story that went page to page to page. Um, and so in a, in a very distinct order. Rule number one, no one will ever be where you saw them last, even if you only saw them 10 seconds ago, even if you said, wait right here. Let me tell you my preferred version of the story. A storyline which doesn't involve my throwing up on the great goose duvet, the 18th century marble dresser of my future nightgown, throwing up even into the eyelets of the pillowcase onto the exact patch of floor where I step too shakily the next morning. This promotes some bloody tantric wake-up ritual, like hypnosis. Let's stay here forever, Beatrice. God, is that his handprint? Gets out of bed and walks across the soft blue, oh so Beatrice carpet to grab her rope from the back of the door to disappear in the direction of the castle kitchen. But even now at seven, William has the eye of a draftsman and can make anything out of anything. And it's 1925 and he's making a royal coach out of thin air and a tiny gear and a soldering kit. Never brought it up if she hadn't asked. We spent the day together drinking wine, playing tennis under the noon sun. Packing kiwis that were crushed in the end, water, roquefort, bread crusts, and everything into a shopping bag. We hacked two hours into the Jura. And yet you find magic in clouds uncharmed. And there's the earlier interface that was actually, I think, a little bit more interesting in terms of the story, but a little bit harder to deal with. So, small stories, handheld poetry. But there's something else we know. And obviously, um, we know from, from this moment in time, audiences exist for long-form digital narrative and even long-form interactive. People could spend 30 hours inside a game world, after all. 30 hours binging Netflix. So in another area of the digital world, I'm also struck by the number of fan fictions being written online in serial installments, mostly if the comments can be believed by young women. It's not at all unheard of for a writer to post every Sunday night for two years. And maybe you're that 17-year-old writing something for two, th two years, and maybe you're her subscribers. I look at Tumblr role plays in which 14-year-old girls finishing their O-levels are also mobilizing a cast of 12 for a branching narrative play on the fly, casting and producing what is essentially a multi-branching collaborative novella in about 12 hours. 
For what it's worth, some of these ephemeral threads I catch and am able to follow seem better along almost every dimension than a fully funded multi-year collaborative writing project with which I was associated only a decade before. The writing here energetic and multi-threaded and fast, and the pleasure of reading and writing and acting and branching and being electric together, sometimes just this side of synchronous is obvious. And these examples contradict what I'd come to accept as trending about granularity and scale in digital narratives, also duration and audience attention. So I started to work at a larger scale, enabled by the wide open canvas of the Unity game engine, inspired by the personal virtual reality environment of the Oculus Rift, and emboldened by audience hunger for long form narratives. One work in progress is entitled Everyone at This Party is Dead, or sometimes called Cardamom of the Dead. And it's one of the first literary works for the Rift. It's an expanding work that at this point contains about 30 small narrative worlds explored in a sandbox environment. You enter the piece standing at the edge of an island and in the middle of a soundscape of a party taking place with guests being named. These were the guests of my 21st birthday and they are all now dead. What follows is a fictionalized narrative, at times semi-autobiographical, at other times entirely made up, and you're urged to explore houses and stones and artifacts spread across the terrain of the island at skewed scales, like a dreamscape. Addressable objects are signaled by a tear-shaped signposting and will propel you into a different environment in order to access and bring to light three longer stories of the dead woven through the work via both the content and the linking structure. A story of a sudden illness and euthanasia, a coming-of-age story relating to a murder, and a meta theme of collecting as a consoling practice. In filmic terms, the piece probably had a runtime of about four hours. In practice, people could engage with the work for about four minutes before becoming nauseous. I was talking to the grad students about this. I'll just show a little bit about this. Do some snaps of it. Eighteen diaries in a used coffee cup are in her big shoulder bag. Heloise carries them everywhere now. It's only six years worth, but it's a start. She'll empty P.O. all of Miss Dean's files off the computer when she has time soon. She touches each page like a relic and reads with that concentration, trying to force her Miss Dean's voice into her head, a conversation, the one she's avoiding. Mm -hmm. So as you explore, you'll go into... And of course, if you're in a VR environment, of course, you can be looking up and around. This is sort of an impoverished view. And in these kinds of environments, of course, every, every environment can have a different aesthetic and a different poetic feel. One of the sunbeams focuses on the tiniest golden glow, just a sliver sneaking underneath the spark tied around her eyes. Tight, soft, cotton, swelling this glow. Don't move. Damn him, that voice. It's also great for um, the Oculus Rift is almost uh, impossible to resist second person storytelling machine or giving direction machine. Pulls her hair back and forth across the pillow. A red sheet and he's stuck. Not affecting a windswept and worried retro look. Not for sure. I knew why they watched me. Had a sense of the currency of being younger and a girl with knowing eyes. High school boys? My romantic connections were like science experiments. An A student but perfunctory. Lab notes with neat handwriting and an eye to the grave. My encounters with girls cautious. 
handling nitroglycerin, the extra credit assignment you stay up all night to do, combining acids and acids, making small, clean monsters there. Can I go down? Oh, this, I meant to put this earlier. This is a very funny slide, actually. This is, um, it should have gone with the Paris series. But at one point, the iPad stopped working and they called me in. And there was a series of about 40 pictures of this woman who had kind of couldn't figure out what to do and just kept like taking her picture repeatedly with it increasing anger. So I show that because she's not really, you can't tell who she is, but I thought it was very, very funny. It would be a beautiful series of uh, where people are at. Okay. I still believe it to be mostly true. The screen-based electronic literature is less likely to be engaged as a book than a gallery object, perhaps especially when we share these in, um, in those kinds of public space spaces. Or maybe that it's the work themselves are almost their own trailers. Even this year's award-winning prize, Samantha Gorman's stunning work for iPad, held the attention of conference attendees at the Future Storytelling Conference in New York this past September for about 60 seconds each, my own very unscientific study as I ate a sandwich in the corner. But of course, a showcase like that doesn't favor four-hour engagement. But surely it's teaching us at some level to treat works on screen as conceptual art and to scan for design and HCI, for code rather than narrative. And that's certainly another fascinating way this is going. I'm going to start speeding up now. Um, I tend to be a lyric outlier at many events where the story-making machine, the code and instructions for its use is the art. Algorithmically generated texts that signal that one of the futures of narrative is not narrative at all. I tend not to do that kind of work, but my one sweet spot there relates to my work in visualization. I'm fascinated by the ways in which software originally created to maximize business value, for example, especially IBM software, might also be a powerful tool for crafting computer-generated works in which I do see the potential for narrative. Emerging practices like content analytics and sentiment analytics analyze vast archives, large quantities of unstructured data sources, as well as non-textual and other non-traditional forms of data sets. This is the same kind of software that powered IBM's Watson, the computer that defeated the Human Jeopardy champions. It can also help us uncover insights gleaned from our own life logging, our hundreds of thousands of emails, our ephemera, our health data, our Instagram, all of our archives. And this is going to be one future of memoir. And with a bit of tweaking under the hood or through combined, combining life logs of more than one person or deliberate contamination of the archive, it could also be a fiction generator and a machine for building poetry. It also recalls for me Mark Bernstein's ideas about sculptural hypertext characterized by the removal of links rather than by adding links to an initially unlinked text, end quote, with sculptural hypertext being the possible editing mode for works generated through data analytics. And on that note of everything being new again, I'm going to finish by telling you about returning to writing aero narratives for that room and thinking beyond it and making a case for a future fiction story world. So here goes. My vision for this one possible future of narrative is ambitious in scope with games as a haunting. What I think comes next are spatialized AR fictional story worlds to be explored over days or weeks, not hours, with a granularity and density of text then that has not yet been seen in in situ or mobile works. Future AR fictions will be vast, like early hypertext. They'll have guard fields, like story space. They'll be persistent and ubiquitous. They'll unfold over days. They will rely on contextual and real-time data. They'll pull stories from the surroundings. They'll be supported by hardware that doesn't leave our arms sore or our hands cold. And they'll allow that one of the great pleasures of this kind of text is in making. The reading and writing environment at the level of interface will be similar, allowing for networked real-time collaboration, like online role play. It's potentially a living, growing narrative with the promise of the unfinished gorgeousness of a book without end. My research and experiments to make some of the first full-scale augmented reality spatialized long-form story worlds access using next-generation AR glasses is part of a larger collaborative research project I have with Dr. Steve Mann. Steve is widely considered to be the father of both augmented reality and wearable computing and a computer science pioneer who's developed the next generation of AR head-mounted glass display technology, a made-in-Canada technology that surpasses the more widely known Google Glass. 
Indeed Man's Digital Eyeglass Laboratory is at the epicenter of innovation. He's been called a modern day Leonardo da Vinci. And if you meet him, he's just, he's fantastic. What difference might AR hardware make to literary creation in this medium? A really big difference, I think. Although even this version of AR glass, metaspace glass, is an intermediate form, it's easier to think past the human-computer interaction nightmare of AR via smartphones. Better field of vision will enable better registration, moving beyond the postage stamp image in the corner of your eye that Google Glass had. More importantly, we can use our translatable skills. I missed what I first loved about hypertext and was sad to give up the dream of a persistent story world, a dream-like filmic palimpsest. And better hardware allows us to take advantage of other technological advantage. The very small chunks of information and fleeting, easily intelligible experiences are so at odds with the incredible density of information that's now possible to build into these experiences. This hardware will be networked and collaborative. We can share poetry and inhabit it in a community, though we needn't. The author, if needed, if indeed there is a single author, might even allow us to change it. I want to show you just now... Oh, hang on. Um, just uh, the concept video from Meta, so you get a sense of how this technology is different than the technology I've been showing you, and I'd like you to think about what you would make using the affordances of what you see now, given what um, you've seen has been built. <laughs> So one of the really interesting things about it is that Meta allows you to actually create within the glasses. It allows us to share things. One of the great things, I was at a panel at Mars um, uh, last week with Steve and with a number of other people talking about AR. And he was talking about being able to create uh, pipelines and share them with somebody else wearing them and sending information through the pipeline. Um, it also means that I could be um, sculpting something and transmitting it over the network and you could get it like that vase or a sculpted object and change it and send it back to me. So there are some very interesting implications for the creation of collaborative artwork but this is also quite amazing for story worlds as you can imagine um, these being both expressive and collaborative. We could play in it, we could create our own AU version of the story. Um, and this is really a huge technical feat, um, and in some ways a minor example to think of, you know, you, you, you create something and send it to the 3D printer, but it's revolutionary in all sorts of ways, and I think it's a potential tool for storytelling. Um, you know, you can see the, the first-person shooters they're doing, but you can also imagine, um, I hope, the kinds of possibilities and what you could bring to it. Leaving aside for a second the idea of networked and collaborative narratives, the first large-scale mobile narrative AR project we're imagining is a dense literary dreamscape that's going to be revisited over many days, um, made possible both by the new technologies and also new practices of experiencing stories through technology. So relying on the idea that people can play for 30 hours and relying on the idea that people can binge watch for 30 hours. We're hoping to make something with the density of a novel alongside the rich linkages and possibilities for rereading promised by hypertext, combined by the potent with the potent poetics of the interplay between the real and fictional worlds and the bodies walking through them. That's kind of the hallmark of, uh, of AR. 
Through a series of 2,000 interconnected pages or lexias or nodes crossing dozens of city blocks and designed to be explored over time, ideally and in contrast to currently available experiences leisurely over many weeks rather than days, the story nodes are woven through into each other in multiple ways and aligned with real world reference telling a complex shifting story of stalking, loss, hoarding, a shrink machine responsive to the viewer's touch and eccentric mornings that pull into evenings in an out of the ordinary place, your own neighborhood. It also plays with multiple points of view in a way that resonates with what AR Glass does so superbly, acting as a mediating eye. The piece will initially be coded for Toronto, but it's designed to be the kind of city story that could be superimposed in many urban locations. So it could be brought to Buffalo, for example, and you could experience it with your glasses. The piece is a character-driven fictional palimpsest, and the nature of reading a spatialized fiction means that a reader is unlikely to encounter the same story twice in the same way, and each reader, each engagement with the piece will be very different. This is in part because a reader can choose to visit, read, view the sections of the piece in any order, and an author can weave through a variety of favorite persuasive paths. But there are also particular aspects of electronic literature and augmented reality that come into play. For example, through coding, I may make it, it impossible for the reader to return to a character or decade once it's been encountered. It's also possible to serve up new context based on time of day or the number of hours already spent with the piece. The challenge, of course, is to create a sustained world with sufficient narrative strength and cohesion to take advantage of the enormous possibilities of this emerging genre and the possibilities posed by man's breakthrough in AR hardware development. The story worlds created as part of the project will be among the first fictions written for and iteratively with Metaspace Glass, and as such will not simply be future fictions, but also texts to think alongside, objects to help us as artists to theorize both the hardware and software as expressive tools, the changing viewing situation, the evolution of this technology, the translatable skills and literacies needed to build and understand these texts and environments, and texts that will allow us to consider what's at stake in the power of experiencing the world in this way, and then using AR glass to see and be seen. And I hope you realize that's true for all of these things, whether they're failures on particular terms, whether they work in particular ways. The idea of working with and alongside this technology helps us to understand what it means to be um, in this moment of digital life. And it helps us to, um, if not predict the future, to work actively to create the kind of futures we want. And I've had this piece, you're probably wondering what this is in the background, I didn't realize I was at that slide. But for Steve Mann, um, who's been very, very interested in, in surveillance and surveillance, the most interesting narrative is less the one you imagine than the one you inhabit. This is something I just wanted to, to stress too, that when you have glasses that can help you to see things, he's very interested in visualizing valence and looking back at lookers. And if you want to think of one of the politics of watching around augmented reality is that, you know, a lot of talk about like you know Google Glass and glass holes and people taking pictures of you. Never underestimate the capacity and the, uh, the democratizing potential of having glasses that can watch watchers. Um, in Steve's case, he's particularly fascinated by watching cameras. Um, these are all the cameras in the men's urinals. If you've ever seen, these are using AR glass to see all of the cameras watching you. Um, you can see where lights coming. You can see where light's directed. Um, you could use these, you can imagine, to actually um, do walks through your city and find all of the surveillance cameras. You could share these collaboratively. Um, these are their own kinds of possibly documentary, but also possibly their own kinds of poems. We're also working on a new kind of AR theater to exploit this. You can imagine different kinds of gaming situations in which you could, uh, you could use the power of seeing and seeing the way the light works. Um, in order to create new kinds of situations. As for me now as always, I'm interested in using AR to make the world a little more magical and working alongside my students and associates to invent, design, build, and deploy next generation AR technologies and to imagine compelling narrative practices in this medium. We try, we fail, we try again. The industrial concept videos promoting AR suggest a pretty instrumentalized world. But you're catching me in an optimistic moment, one which has me thinking that a compelling narrative overlay on the real world will find an audience, and predicting a breakthrough moment for this no longer new technology, a future that I think aligns quite brilliantly with new media poetics. AR is both expressive and receptive future fiction storytelling machine that carries inside it some of the foundational dreams of electronic literature. Thank you. I think everybody needs to stretch. Okay, one question there. Um, so do you find yourself using Unity often now? 
Yeah, yeah. I was I was telling the grad students it's sort of a bittersweet story when we when the lab was um, um, first being developed in 2004. We wanted to, we, we had really only one kind of software available to us. It was through the real incredible generosity of the people at Georgia Tech. And they were working on a software called DART, the Designer's Augmented Reality Toolkit. And it was utterly brilliant, except it was built on, um, some of you may remember, um, uh, Macromedia Director. So when the software was ready, um, and they were using it because everybody used Macromedia Director, um, by 2004, nobody really used Macromedia Director anymore. And it was a heavy learning curve for something that would only be used for AR. So it was, it was a bit depressing. And then the Havoc ph physics engine dropped out of Macromedia Director. So long story short, we ended up having to build our own software. And we had no comparative advantage in this. Um, so we aligned with, um, I, I, I met some really great computer vision scientists. That's when we thought we'll go drag and drop. We'll do what our lab can do best. We won't have like heavy duty 3D. We'll work with film clips. And, and I, off, I always thought of this as pre-visualization. The idea that you know, 10 years from now, we'll be able to build what we really want. Right now, let's just have it quick and dirty. Let's try to figure out what a story in space looks like. Let's just use paper-based mar pa markers. Um, let's get something very, very fast. And we learned so much through that. And we're very platform agnostic. We had different kinds of software. Whenever AR software came out then, as it started to incrementally, at the beginning, there was really nothing. We built our own soft, um, software called Snapdragon AR. Um, we still use this for rapid pre-visualization. Um, but, you know, we always had about four or five people working in the lab. We're coding just in this little university space. And when the real money hit and the millions of dollars start rolling into AR, when Unity came, it basically had everything on our wish list. In-house, we were working on this, you know, drag and drop 2D. We could also do drag and drop 3D. Um, it was very interesting. We could have, because, because of the way computer vision-based AR works, where the camera sees something, um, it can tell the area of something. That's how uh, a piece gets louder when you're close to it and whispers when you're far away. It can also taste collision. So we were able to look at sort of uh, even storyboarding interactive cinema. We could have the girl in the farmhouse is the fire. The girl and the dog is the drowning. We could have, so it was really interesting to build our own software. Um, but, you know, about three or four years ago when Vuforia comes out with a plugin for Unity to make it AR, when we realized that we, have, we can build a plugin um, that can send Unity files to our tracking system where we can build something in Unity and it becomes an app. We can take uh, files, that we can get something in Unity and put it into Oculus Rift. Um, it is bittersweet because we've stopped our own development. There was no point competing against these like, huge entities that were doing everything we wanted. And there's natural feature detection, there's AR. Um, there's always, we were talking about this with the grad students earlier, there's always a risk when you know, you're working within the same engine. So that slide I had where when you're working in Flash and you work on a single timeline, that changes things. It changes things when you work on a spatial canvas. It changes when you move from a pencil to a camera. It changes. Um, but I guess the short answer to your question is yes, we're heavily invested in Unity now. And I think it's actually, it's a very good investment of something to learn. I mean, it can just, with, with Unity, it's also um, the basis for the SDK for Metaspace Glass. Um, it is, uh, it's got an incredibly generous community. You can buy artifacts, you can buy an entire like medieval village. You can, um, so yeah, yeah. And it's helped our workflow. It makes things faster. It makes things quite compelling. Yep, in the back. Have you ever played the Mix computer game? Yeah. yeah. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't um, um, hugely addicted to Mist like some people were at that time. But yeah, those early CD-ROM games, absolutely. Yeah, your island thing reminded me of that as the uh, most, most sophisticated, of course. Well, I don't even know uh, whether more sophisticated. Ideally, in future iterations, maybe more sophisticated. But yeah, I mean, it's really important to recognize that um, um, that's why I tried to sort of stress that these practices are resonant with, like, you know, not just the last hundred years. I mean, we could go back to like an ancient sort of reworking of what augmentation might mean. But um, we can get carried away thinking of new media and digital poetics, like we're all inventing the wheel and that it's new every time. And, it's, uh, you know, definitely go back to early computer games, go back to, that's why I think it's really interesting now and important to say, even, you know, supposedly failed experiments of electronic literatures that happened 15 years ago or stuff we're not going to revisit might be well worth revisiting, um, let alone going back and looking at early experimental cinema. Um, you know, I teach a course called Future Cinema, 
and I always say with a colleague that I want to teach it in tandem with early and silent cinema because I think you've got very much the same kind of moment where we can draw on so many rich heritages and take a look at, um, at new kinds of, uh, the going forward, building new media but with a real awareness of older forms. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was thinking it was a pity Ubisoft seemed to have stopped making that series because I like to see what the game in its made with AI would be like. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting too. And I mean, that's one really interesting and fast way to find out whether you want to work in a medium or how it might, um, how it might work is to translate them. We were talking about translation a little bit earlier today, but the idea of taking something that's kind of compelling in one iteration, so maybe a CD-ROM desktop game, and porting it to AR and seeing whether there are any things that, that improve with it, what, what doesn't work, what doesn't, it can help us sometimes to find out what might be the good match between form and content. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean I can and I can't. I'm one of those people, and because of my background, my background was not in video gaming. And really, I, I sort of hit grad school at a time where it was sort of like um, the serious work of the digital and the serious work of electronic literature as against the world of gaming. And it seems really silly now, but, um, but for the longest time those were sort of separate domains. And so there's a whole, um, um, there's a whole scholarship around gaming that, um, you know, that I came to very, very late. That said, one of the things that I'm possibly most interested in is the idea of, um, is augmented reality ARGs, the idea of like how you go out and create different kinds of games. I mean, games are just this fascinating way of structuring. I mean, it's so interesting when I started with that idea of like the room is so scary, I wish I'd done the circus. Um, I could have also said, I wish I knew more about games, which are essentially about saying, you know, how do we, you know, if, if you're in an empty room and I put glasses on you, you could maybe cross the room based on the power of my words or based probably on being chased by my sound. But what also drives you, a mystery, a puzzle, uh, you know, so if you, if you look at those disciplines that have rich traditions in moving people through space, from Disney Imagineering to early video games, there's so much there. Um, and I think probably we're going to see a lot of um, both funding and a lot of uh, interest in uh, using these games to play. Uh, really, even, even the really clunky AR, like when, when we first started to do AR sort of in the you know, early 2000s, I forget what university had a research program where they were playing like Doom or something in between their university buildings. And you actually had to have a backpack with an open laptop on it because there were no handhelds. So the back, the, the, um, you had to have a power source and the laptop had to be open and running and you were going through. And then part of the storytelling was why are you wearing this stupid getup? Well, it's because you're hunting and you know, you, because you're, um, and that's one of the go-to things. People have always been quite, what would you want to see? Like giant dragons, what do you want to do? I want to shoot things. It's it's also one of the easiest things to do on a handheld device like this where you don't have to have, when I talk about things being registered in the real world, it's as if, if I had an AR person in a chair, you'd ideally want them to look like they're sitting in the chair at the right level. You don't want them hovering. Mostly they hover though, so that's why we've got a lot of AR ghosts, right? Um, if you've got AR where it's just like there'll be spaceships and you punch something, that's the easiest thing in the world. It's not actually a true augmented reality that's just a... Uh, but it, it, it kind of fits with that. So it can, it can actually make it easier to work within um, um, game structures. And I think there's also um, a really, really rich um, understanding of media and people. I mean, it's no, it's no um, accident that game mechanics, that the combination of story and gameplay is, um, is almost super addictive. <laughs> for people, when, when done correctly, that's why you end up with 30 hours. It's not because people love doing this. People hated glasses, but they loved this with their thumbs. It's not really it. It's trying to hit people's sweet spots between you know, a certain kind of challenge, a certain kind of engagement. Um, and I think that's where you know, a lot of early, more experimental works, less commercially driven works, and I guess I put a lot of electronic literatures in this category as well, didn't quite hit that. 
didn't quite hit where people were challenged enough. You know, think of the woman with the, uh, you know, taking the 40 selfies, angry, 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 not hitting her sweet spot at all, nothing but frustrating her. Um, this was not sort of that perfect match between like figuring out the puzzle of my story, figuring out the mystery and the death, figuring out the, this is just somebody like, you know, like I just want to shut this off maybe. Um, and I think going forward, you know, and especially as people's literacies change really rapidly, I don't think anybody would have even predicted 15 years ago that anybody would binge watch like, you know, like 300 hours of Games of Thrones, Game of Thrones. Um, you know, it would not have been seeming to be possible. Likewise, the idea that people would watch films on something this small. Um, you know, there are things that people said, you know, you just couldn't predict that people would do. So, you know, people's literacies are a moving target, people's pleasures are a moving target, um, and I think we need to have sort of everything in our toolkit to try to figure out as writers and as artists, and not just that we, um, uh, that we cater to that, but I think to recognize that um, sometimes we cater and sometimes we don't. You know, we were talking earlier about like texts of jouissance and texts of pleasure. Um, you know, when, when you want people to be able to, you know, meet your piece in this way. And, and I'm happy to look back into, you know, all sorts of, you know, film and screenwriting and quilting and video gaming. And, um, and I think we're probably on the precipice of seeing a lot of AR video games. And with Meta, um, you know, in those space classes, the, you know, the concept video, if you were to get the, the SDK now, you know, you're not building something that's, as good as the concept video ever is. But you can have this collaborative environment. And I think that really will change that. The idea that we're inhabiting the same networked environment will absolutely change what we write and build. Yeah. Um, are you talking specifically about uh, like 52 Cards Psycho? Yeah. I mean, there, there are two different things. When we first started, um, it was so kind of um, emergent um, and I never expected that students would be selling things or having big, you know, th that was, you know, as part of, you know, an, an in-lab experiment. Something like that, obviously, you know, It'd be easier, obviously, to use something that was out of copyright than something with copyright when you're using found footage. I mean, I work in a film department where people do work with found footage, so we try to push the envelope anyway. So, I mean, that, that's one context in which um, I think we, we are living in this kind of collagist moment where, you know, I don't want to tell students that in their regular practice, they take bits and pieces of the culture and then when they come into an environment where ostensibly they're studying and making culture, they're supposed to leave all that at the door because I'm afraid of a lawsuit. Um, that said, I would tell my students when they're building this that if they're really hoping to get a big book contract or sell it or they're bringing it down to Sundance, to be careful about those materials. Uh, most of those things, they're not, they're not sold. I mean, that's shown that, you know, that piece has actually gone around the world. That went around the world as a student piece, but, you know, it was shown at Isaiah in Singapore. It was shown and you know, nobody, nobody was thinking that Alan Rhodes was trying to, like, make money off of Hitchcock. Um, some things, though, um, um, we made the mistake. This, this slide here has, um, these are stones that I made for when my kids were little. And um, their natural feature detection, so the kids could go around, my girls could go and find fairies in the garden. And um, I actually think I probably could have sold this. I and mean, the kids saw it, and they'd be great. They've got like little, little, um, little fairy things that come down. But I think, unfortunately, in the first coating, by the time I realized that, I think we used a Disney fairy. I was like, there's no way you could ever sell that. So by the time I, you know, and life's too short, who wants to spend their time making Disney fairies because they might make money off of it? But it would be very, very fun. And then uh, I think two years later, they ended up with like Disney birthday cake fairies. So I was like, oh, well, of course. But um, so I, I suppose if you're thinking that you have the kind of media that is going to circulate in channels where that's critically important to you, most of the time I've thought of these as prototypes and experiments.